This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Welcome to this week's edition of Mizzou. That's for your podcast for Missouri Athletics here on KC Sports Network. I am your host, Tucker Franklin, joined as always by Gabe DeArmond and Maggie Johnson. Listen, the Missouri Tigers are 7-1 and one heading into their bye week. After that, a big matchup with the University of Georgia. Ever heard of them? Uh, it's a, it's vibes are good in, in Columbia, Gabe. How uh, how was your football watching weekend? Uh, how was everything in Columbia? Yeah, it was good. Um, look, I, I root for two things. Number one, eleven a.m. kickoffs. We didn't get that on Saturday. Number two, have the game decided like middle of the third quarter so I can start writing. My my column was done when that game was over because it was pretty obvious at twenty four nothing. Like, South Carolina just didn't have time to kick nine field goals, and that's what it was going to take in that game. Um, you know, and I know there was a there was a little bit of a lull in the third quarter, and there was a, about 45 minutes there where everybody was like, oh, my God, what are we doing? Why can't we play a full game? All that. Look, that game was over, and yeah. Missouri knew it, and South Carolina knew it, and Eli Drinkwitz knew it, and all – However many thousand people that headed to Harpo's or Billiards or Shiloh or wherever they went in the second half also. Absolutely. Maggie, uh, how was your Saturday? Um, I don't cheer for 11 a.m. kickoffs unless I'm watching the game at home, unless it's an away game. And I know some people were cheering for an 11 a.m. Georgia kickoff, but I'm going to the game. So also not, I wasn't. So um, shout out 2.30, I guess 3.30 local time. 2.30 uh, Central Time for those um, listening. And if you didn't know, if you haven't been on Twitter and you've been living in Iraq, it's a 2.30 Central Time on CBS and SEC Network. So um, shout out primetime game. Let's go for all of you that complain we know, don't get primetime games. We got one. But no, it was great. Homecoming was very successful. I stayed almost the whole game. When did I? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, there was, like, a minute left. Yeah. <laughs> like, I stayed the whole game. I didn't go to Harpo's with with the students, okay? Okay. I was okay. there basically the entire day. I, uh, um, yeah. I did not go to the game. But uh, it seemed like there it looked like a great turnout. Everything that you wanted to be for homecoming, uh, lots of gold. Uh, saw some pretty important uh, recruits there as well. That's always, that's always good when there's a good turnout, a good game, good performance by the team. Uh, on homecoming as well but really overall I think outside of that third quarter of just offensive production wise when it seemed like they went a little bit vanilla on the play calling a little bit uh, I don't think there's much to complain about from this game just uh, gave general thoughts from uh, Missouri's performance uh, against South Carolina which the South Carolina team is kind of reeling right now yeah I mean it's it's two weeks in a, like we start most seasons and say if you can beat Kentucky and South Carolina you're probably in line for a pretty good year right yeah. I mean, that, that's just truthful. Obviously, the goal was winning the East, and, and everybody has that goal. But step one for Missouri is be better than those two teams, and you're going to put yourself in position to you know win eight games and, and do some things. Um, so from the end of the first quarter in Lexington through the end of the game on Saturday, Missouri outscored those two teams 72-19. to 19. They did it while basically taking a full quarter off against South Carolina. Um, I, I think it's clear they are a better team than Kentucky. They are a better team than South Carolina. I don't know that the the gap is narrow at all. I think they're significantly better than both of them. Mm. Um, they they came out. I, I I had said I don't know. I here when you follow a, a winning team, you find you have a lot more requests for podcasts and radio interviews and stuff. So I don't remember where I say things. I just say them. Uh, but I had said at some point last week that. We learned a little bit about their maturity against Kentucky by not panicking at 14 nothing. I said, thought we were going to learn a little bit more about it against South Carolina because even though there was a bye week, it would have been an easy spot to kind of go, eh, got Georgia in two weeks. It's going to be awesome. Next week, we, we don't have to practice for a couple days. We get time off. These guys suck. They're two and four. They can't beat us. And it would have been easy to all of a sudden look up at halftime and you're in a, in a fight. Missouri didn't do that. That game was 24 nothing, five drives in. You know, they had a, a three and out to start, and then they dominated the next 30 minutes. I mean, in ways that, 
Like they made South Carolina look like South Dakota for two and a half quarters. South Dakota, honestly, looked better My, for most. South, of South Dakota has a better <laughs> offensive line. I don't know if they're a better. Oh team, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, in credit, part of the offense that I haven't been crediting all season, like credit the offensive line. We, you know, we averaged five point four yards a carry. They didn't allow a sack the entire game. You know, so credit those areas of the game that maybe haven't looked the best all season I wouldn't say our offensive line have been terrible the past two games but I think that they probably looked better than they have all season yeah I I think so too I think a big reason you're seeing a little bit of it here Cody Strader 26 carries you know beat up 24 to nothing early gives you a little bit more opportunities to get 26 carries still seems like a lot when you see it on the stat sheet uh 26 carries 159 yards that's 6.1 yards per carry if you're keeping track at home but two to two rushing touchdowns as well and and look if it were, I mean, I think if every football coach had his desire, he would just be able to hand the ball off and and just win that because there is yeah. less likelihood of a catastrophic mistake doing that than almost yeah. anything else. It was working, um, and and I, I thought I thought it was pretty clear about after a couple drives in the third quarter when something just wasn't quite working with the passing game. Yeah. I thought Eli and Kirby Moore pretty clearly just said, you know what. We don't need style points. If we just run this clock, like South Carolina can't score 24 points. So we don't really care if we win 24-16 or 34-12. or We just got to win. So hand the ball off. Let the defense in in the running game win this game. And it did. And and I liked that they got the last touchdown because it made the margin look, I think, a little more impressive. And and I don't even think think the game was as close as 34-12 indicated. I mean... There wasn't right. a second where I thought South Carolina had a chance to win. I mean, and the defense, they just, they were the star of the show. And that, which is crazy to think because the offense obviously just dominated. They, they didn't score. Obviously they got the three and out the first possession of the game, which uh, it looked kind of bleak uh, after you get the ball for first and you don't, you know, ram it down their throats. But then they didn't, that that possession and then the last possession of the first half when Cook took the knee to go into the locker room, those are the only two possessions of the first half that they didn't score. Other than that, they they allowed one field goal for South Carolina, the defense. They played amazing. They, that's the first since, I, I saw in Power Mizzou, that's the first game since November of 2020 that they didn't allow a touchdown. The the defense looked amazing. There were so many sacks. There were so many tackles for loss. They made Rattler look incompetent, to be perfectly honest. South Carolina's offensive line is terrible, and the defense made them look even worse than they are. Yeah, I mean, I said in the third quarter of that game, I said, I don't, I can't tell if Spencer Rattler is good at quarterback or not. Like, I, I can't even assess him based on this game. Oh. Um, it, because he just has no time. I mean, I you know, they they would have scored even less if not for a couple of third down penalties that kept drives going. I mean, one of them was like there was abs- it wasn't a dirty play. There was nothing Missouri could do, but it was a penalty. Just the angle, like Johnny Walker kind of got shoved and he basically clotheslined Spencer Rapp. You know, um again, not his fault, not a dirty play. It it, it was a penalty, but it extended a drive. They had another kind of dumb roughing the passer penalty, but I was I looked up the numbers. I tweeted this out on on Monday morning. Missouri's defense is allowing fewer yards per play and fewer points per game than it did last season. Like the thought among Missouri fans for the last three weeks has been, what happened to our defense? Why are we not good? No, it's actually slightly better than it was last year. And I feel like they're making more. The last couple of weeks, they've gotten more takeaways. They're making they're sixth in the country in sacks, so they're making more at Drinkwood's calls it havoc plays. Like I'm not ready to say this is an elite defense, but I think it's on par with what they had last year. Mm. They're doing it in different ways than they did it last year too. I think um, when, when you talk about the defense and like Spencer Radler, like coming into the coming into this game, statistically he was having a very a pretty pretty solid year. Um, and you look at 23 or 40, 217 yards in a pick, and that, that pick comes out of big time too because, well, you guys both mentioned that, you know, never really felt like that game was out of Missouri's control. 
they had a chance to make it interesting there when they got that drive. And you, you start doing the math there. Uh, touchdown makes this, you know, you start, okay, maybe they get an onside kick there and another touchdown. This this is a ball game then. And for the Missouri defense to be like, mm, yeah, no, you're not going to get, we're going to just go ahead and pick this off, force a turnover here. And uh, then to punctuate it with a touchdown after that uh, was impressive. Just the, the complimentary football that they've been able to play this year, I think has been the biggest thing because last year we talked about it a whole lot. They had the defense, they didn't have the offense. Now it seems like they have both, and it's it's cool to see some complimentary football uh, happening and going on in Columbia. And I, I got a couple texts in the third quarter that was like, "What are we doing? This is garbage." Blah blah. And I, you know what kind of hit me? I said, "You know, a sign that you're good, you don't have to play four quarters to win, <laughs> right? Like nobody plays an A game every week, right? And so if you're good, you win with your B or C game. And Missouri's actually done quite a bit of that this year." I feel like they're finally adjusting whenever things aren't going that well on defense. I feel like the first few games, they kind of struggled doing that. I feel like they would kind of, like if the blitz wasn't working, they just kind of kept blitzing every time. And they weren't really adjusting to that. I feel like once um, South Carolina's receiver went out, they kind of decided, well, their passing game's not really going to work now, so let's just send five, six rushers every time and put that pressure on Rattler because what are they going to do now? They don't have anybody really to throw to. Yeah, And I just feel like after that, there was just nothing that South Carolina could do at that point. And I mean, Uh Rattler beat us a couple of times and got those first downs, but that was going to happen. I mean... That's because Rattler is a decent quarterback, but it wasn't going to happen every time. I was surprised. And like, I don't say this to take anything away from Missouri. They were a far better team. They played a good game. They they won easily, all that. I, I'm not sure how South Carolina got to the point they are from just last year. I mean, that, that was an mm-hmm. eight-win football team that beat Clemson and Tennessee last year. Yep. They're, like, they're bad. They're, they're near... They might be Vandy level bad. And they I have some see last year. Yeah. yeah. I, I've got some thoughts on the South Carolina program just as a whole. But at first, I got to tell you about our folks, our good friends at homefieldapparel.com. I'm rocking the Homefield Apparel shirt, uh, the Mizzou Raw shirt. Uh, Maggie's rocking the uh, Script Tiger shirt, the Ringer shirt. Good looks all around at homefieldapparel.com. Make sure you go check them out. 15% off your uh, first order if you use the code KCSN23 at checkout. That's at homefieldapparel.com. You are more than Mizzou. They've got some really great Idaho and Kibbe Dome merch. I'm a big fan of the Kibbe Dome, a uh, big fan of Idaho. You got some good North Texas stuff. All of the schools that you would play at NCAA Football 14 to uh, to kind of start your career at, they have them at uh, homefieldapparel.com, so go check them out. We're going to take a quick break, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about South Carolina in this program uh, coming up next. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. And with DraftKings Parlays, everyone's got a shot at an even bigger basketball wins. String together multiple bets from the same game or build your own parlay across multiple games for a shot at making your payday even sweeter. Basketball is more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code KCSN. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code KSTSN, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, welcome back into Mizzou. That's who, uh, Gabe. I have some very interesting thoughts about about South Carolina, the state of that program right now, because Shane Beamer has kind of built like this Beamer ball culture, right? Like the, everyone's bought into the Beamer ball culture going on in South Carolina. He seems to be fun. He's doing fun stuff at at media days. He's he's doing all this kind of stuff. But then to see this summer how many people, how many players transferred out of South Carolina, that kind of was like a red flag to me. Like, oh, if you, when you, you're you priding yourself on this culture and everything like that, but then you're going to have all these guys transfer out after they've been in your program for a year. That seemed weird to me. That seemed off. Um, so that was that was kind of a red flag to me. I, 
they're they're not in a good spot. Like when it, just when it comes to just like state of things. I mean, Xavier Leggett, you talked about him, Maggie. He's hurt. Spencer Rattler, um, he's he's been having a good statistical year, but again, this game is was weird. Their offensive line's not very good. Their defense isn't very good. They're just in a really bad spot as a program right now, and it seems like Shane Beaver wants to complain about literally everything except his football team, and it seems like he wants to kick everything, uh, too, to break his break his foot. Uh, but I don't. South Carolina is not in a good spot right now. If I'm a South Carolina fan, I'm not feeling very good. Well, and it's tough. Like, that's why this year was so big for Missouri. Mm-hmm. With the SEC bringing Texas and Oklahoma in, you're going to, you've got to be in the top two to get to the title game, all that. Like, it's getting nothing but tougher. And this is already a really difficult league to to claw your way up from the, the bottom to the middle or the middle to the the top. Um, and, yeah, they're... They're in a rough position, man. I mean, I would not have thought after last year that we go into next year talking about Shane Beamer's job security, but I think we go into next year talking about Shane Beamer's job security. I'm surprised they're not talking about Shane Beamer's job security right now. How long has he been there at this point? Is this just year three or year four? I think this is year three. I think he was hired a year after Drinkwitz was. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. and, so and maybe, maybe when, like, you won eight games last year. Like yeah, so everybody like, gets a bad year, but what it creates is okay, next year you got to show us that was the exception. We yeah. we can't because they've got a real chance. They're what two and five. They've got a real chance to be four and eight, you know, and that's tough. It is tough. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to look up South Carolina's schedule because, like, you did mention game, and I thought this was a really good point. Going into every year, it seems like where you say, "Okay, got to beat South Carolina, got to beat Kentucky." That's a good year. We're at that spot now where where Missouri's beating them, and they've, they've got some tougher teams. Uh, they still they still got some meat on the end of back into the schedule here with Georgia, uh, Florida, Arkansas, who put up an absolute stinker. Like that should be an abomination to football what Arkansas just did. Um, they should not be able to play football for the rest of ever. I'm pretty sure, uh, losing seven to three in the year 2023. Yeah, that shouldn't that should not be possible. to Mississippi State. That was I. I was looking up some. I was looking up some like old old uh, scores because I was trying to find how many times Missouri's been better than seven and one yeah. through eight games. And so, like, I looked back at the nineteen oh nine team, and there was a, there was a team. I think it was nineteen oh seven, but I'm not sure. Missouri allowed an average of four point five points a game that year. Do you know where that ranked in college football defensively? 24. Like, 4.5 points a game was barely a top 25 defense, and uh, that's about what Arkansas did on Saturday. So, South Carolina still has Texas A&M, which who knows with Texas A&M. Right. Jacksonville State, uh, that should be a win. The Battle of the Gamecocks right there. I think that's Rich Rod, isn't it? It is Rich Rod. Rich Rod has those, those, those suckers bowl eligible, yeah, too. Well. Um, I think that they're not eligible for a bowl, actually, because they just came up from FCS, I think, this year. They they uh, can play James Madison in an exhibition. <laughs> which I've seen that brought up on the Reddit College Football page. They brought up like, hey, they can probably just play an exhibition game and not call it a bowl game. And just like those two teams play each other, James Madison might roll them because James Madison is good. It's uh, pretty good. Vanderbilt, they, they host Vanderbilt, they host Kentucky, and then they also host in the season with four straight home games. Uh, South Carolina does. Jacksonville State. Vanderbilt, Kentucky, Clemson. I mean, from what I saw on Saturday, I think Kentucky beats South Carolina. Could South or Clemson probably beats South Carolina. I'll say they get one overall Jacksonville State, I guess. Uh, but the Vanderbilt game is going to be a mighty close game. I mean, that, that's five and so that's you know four and eight, three and nine, somewhere in there. Yes. Uh, but we'll never hey, uh, Missouri's got a big game now, though. Gonna- they do. Uh, after the bye week, too, I mean, that's that's big going to this game now, being 7-1, and one, having the bye week before this game. Uh, I don't think that the Missouri schedule makers were anticipating that, but the fact that they get the bye I mean, week before Georgia is huge. It could legitimately not set up better for Missouri. You're 7-1, and one, you get a week off, Georgia has to go play a rivalry game right before you. Um, it, and, I... Yeah, like I'm not saying... I'm. I, Look, I'm not making any predictions or anything like that. I'm just saying that if you line up all the things... Oh, by the way, after Missouri, Georgia has Ole Miss and then at Tennessee. Yeah. So, like, it's kind of the middle of these 
these four big games that are either rivalries or top 25 teams. If you handed Eli Drinkwitz and said, just look, you have to play Georgia and you have to play a mate. Like you can't get out of that, but what would you like us to do to set it up for you? This is kind of it. And it's the, honestly, it's the best, the best time of day too. like Mm -hmm. LSU LSU's playing at Alabama, so of course they're giving them the night game. Like, I don't want to play at Georgia at a night game, so I'm like, okay, give us the day game. <laughs> like, and Coaches hate a road night game more than anything else. Like, if you talk to a coach, he's like, we don't, our guys just hang around the hotel room and watch football, or like, we'll walk around the mall. But like, you, you get there on Friday and you do your walkthrough. And then you've got like 24 hours where you have to figure out what to do with these guys. And uh, they hate playing at night. And it's better than having to play at out in early in the morning because you're afraid that they're not going to be, you know, awake in time or like, you know, yeah. energized and stuff like that. So I think it's like best case scenario. Also, the plays into this is Brock Bowers is probably not going to play in this game. Oh, he's he's not playing. Um I think I saw several weeks, which is just a very seems very college football to be like, yeah, he's out just a few I think, weeks. I I think realistically they're shooting for maybe getting back in the SEC title game if they're playing that weekend. Well, yeah, if they're playing that weekend. Good saving game. Um <laughs> when it comes to this game. Uh, because <laughs> Missouri Yeah, for sure. Missouri jumps up to number sixteen in the AP poll as well from twenty up to sixteen. Uh, a spot behind LSU, which I kind of find it comical that every time that Mizzou and LSU, they always seem to be right next to each other in, in the AP poll, which, I mean, I don't think a lot of people are putting up LSU above Missouri based on just their head-to-head, obviously. But it, it's always this funny. Those two teams just seem to be uh, right by each other. But, yeah, I, I think that Georgia's in a spot now where I don't think they're the number one offense in the country anymore. Uh, they've played some pretty close games. They've, 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 fallen, close they've fallen to third. So disastrous times. It's been it's been tough for them. Missouri, uh, their offense is humming right now against some some SEC competition. It's going to be one of those things, especially with the bye week, that puts a a, a lot of um, a lot of attention on this game. And and I quote tweeted the tweet from the I think it was probably SEC Networks that tweeted out all of the game times or whatever it was or the SEC account. This is like the SEC primetime game, especially when you put it on CBS, like. The, the SEC likes to put these games, like these big games, at the 2.30 time slot. And to put Missouri-Georgia, which could be for the East right now, I believe Missouri's in second place um, when it comes to the to the standings for, for the East. But this could be for the top spot in the SEC East. Missouri then does have a big game against Tennessee coming up after that if they do end up knocking off Georgia. Um, but it is, yeah, a, a, a huge game. And I want to ask you, Gabe, when it, when it comes to... <laughs> I feel like we've been talking about this for a few weeks now. But which is a good thing. We talked about K State being the biggest game of Eli Drinkwood's career. What about where does this game stack up uh, in terms it's of the biggest game of Eli Drinkwood's career? But not I, in terms I, of Eli Drinkwood's career, just like in terms of like Missouri history. Yeah. Um. It, it's so ultimately it's weird the way we look at these things because everybody looks in 2007. I mean, the Kansas game is the biggest game of that yeah. season. It's the biggest game in school history, and it's true. But you know what? If Missouri doesn't go 4-0 between losing to Oklahoma and playing Kansas, that game meant nothing. Like, that, they can't win the division if they didn't go 4 So every game they played after losing to Oklahoma was the biggest game in school history. And then in 2013, every game they played after losing to South Carolina was the biggest game of that season. The, uh, the A&M game just ended up being the biggest one because it was the last one, right? And... Um, then 2014, they got absolutely railroaded by Georgia. It's 34 nothing. One of the worst games. I was so angry. I had seen Billy Joel at Kauffman Stadium on Friday night. It was 11 a.m. game. I woke up at 6 a.m. and drove back to cover that game. And I, I felt personally offended that I woke up at 6 a.m. to come cover that game. Uh, it, it was one of the worst games I've ever seen. But anyway, then every game after that was the biggest game they had. So the thing is, the Georgia game is the biggest game of this year. But if they win it, then suddenly the Tennessee game's actually bigger. Right. And if they win that, the Florida game is even bigger because yeah. the stakes get raised. And the the weird part about this Georgia game is it can either put Missouri at, with kind of pole position to win the East, right? Now, they'll still have work to do. Like, oh, yeah. They, 
they cannot then go lose to Tennessee or lose to Florida and still win the division properly. Here's the weird part. If they lose to Georgia, they cannot win the East. If Georgia beats Florida, they will be 5-0 and entering that game. A win over Missouri would make them 6-0. and It would leave Missouri, what, 3-2 and or 4-2, and whatever that would be. 3-2, and I guess. And even if Missouri ran the table, they'd lose any tiebreaker to Georgia. So, yeah. like, the, on one side, you have this playing for absolutely everything. And on the flip side, this is the first game they've played where a loss actually starts to take some of their goals off the table. You know what's kind of funny is that in that 2007 season, nobody ever, like, we obviously always talk about how important that border war was and how it was, like, one of the biggest games. And I was there, and it was one of the greatest, obviously, one of the greatest games ever. Yeah. But because we lost the Big 12 championship to OU, we don't talk about how that was one of the biggest games. Oh, but, yeah. like, if we win that game, we're in the national championship. But right. we never talk about that, to me, is, like, the biggest game we've ever... Yeah. That game, and we should talk about the, that the Auburn, Auburn game. game as well, because... We win that game. I mean, obviously, we needed a couple other things to play out that day, and they did play out because Auburn ended up, you know, playing in the national championship as well. But, like, we needed, you know, teams to to lose in front of us, and they did. But, like, we played in a natty in probably both of those situations. And, yeah, they are probably two of the biggest games ever, and we don't ever talk about that. But... No, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, side side, you know, side thinking. But um I don't even know why what you were talking about before that. I was like I was already just like yeah, I was just like thinking about that in my head and I'm like, I need to say this whenever game is done. Yeah, because <laughs> it kinda it, it kinda plays sense. right into the point. Every game gets bigger as you win. Uh, uh, yeah, as you're going. Um, but yeah, you were talking about like the, the tiebreaker and things with Georgia. And I'm not sure who Georgia plays after from the east after they play us because they've already played have they played they put they play Ole Miss and Tennessee after Missouri so yeah, yeah I guess they would have but, to I, it literally wouldn't matter it wouldn't because they would be six and oh and Missouri could not possibly win more than six in the SEC and they would lose any tiebreaker by losing to Georgia like Missouri is eliminated from the east if Georgia beats Florida and beats Missouri. oh yeah if they beat us no matter what yep okay yeah that does make sense being Florida fans this week, I guess. See, and that was okay. I didn't. I, I don't agree. That is what I was going to ask. I was going to ask who we're cheering for because we don't want to lose. If they lose to Florida, I I agree too. I I agree with you, Gabe. Because are they out for vengeance? They're not going to lose twice in a row. You got to win the Georgia game to win. I mean, you're going to have to beat Georgia to win the East. You're not doing it without beating. Yeah. And so all you get if they lose to Florida is. Pissed off Georgia with Kirby Smart telling them all week, everybody done quit on you. They gave up. You're yesterday's news. You're not yeah. as good as you were in the last two years. And you get Georgia out to prove a point. And the other thing it does is if Florida wins that game, you now have to take Florida seriously as a threat to win the E. And I'm just a big believer in the fewer teams you have to contend with, the better it is. Just get Florida out, have them lose, get them out of the conversation, and then it's Missouri, Georgia, Tennessee. They all still play each other, and you deal with it. If I remember correctly last year, going into the Missouri-Georgia game, Georgia was coming off of a struggle versus Kent State. Yeah, I like something like that. And, and then that was kind of the talking point. I remember we had a podcast, and it was just like, well, they're going to get pissed off Georgia now. And then they, and they didn't. And, and, and they really didn't. So I, I don't think that. I think Florida's a bad football team. Um, but I, I, I don't think Georgia's taking Missouri lightly this year. No, no, no. because oh, absolutely. of last year. No, I gave it. Missouri should have won when they <laughs> essentially didn't have an offense. Um, so shout out, shout out to Blake Baker yeah. and company in that game. Um, I should, I'm, I might go rewatch that game truthfully just to see, just to see, just to see what was going on there. Um, with with some of the penalties that they had there too, I'll just re piss myself off. I guess is what I want to do. <laughs> Um, it's what a it's what the the process is there, but I do think that that when you start to look at you know the rest of Missouri's slate, and we talked about this last week about changing expectations and everything like that. It's starting to look like you know ten and two is now the expectation. I, you know, I've never really been sold on Arkansas. 
but to have a double digit win season uh, would be massive for the program. And you know, we we have an interview coming up here with uh, with Coach Nutt, uh, Coach uh, David Nutt. If you guys uh, don't know, assistant basketball coach of the Missouri uh, basketball Tigers, we talked to him, and I think it was really cool. You talk about uh, he he tells a great story about you know uh, the AD De- DeAndre Reed Francois. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. This, yeah. I'm gonna call her DeAndre though. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> I was dancing around it because I couldn't think ne- of it. Next time I see her, I might be like, what's up, DeAndre? And she's going to have absolutely no idea what I'm talking to. Like, Speak again, to your podcast. What you- Unle- unless she listens. I don't know. Maybe she listens. Appreciate it. Does, does she have like a, a three-letter acronym that, that people call her by? Yeah, DRA. DRA. That's right. I'm not very good with initials. Uh, so <laughs> he tells a really good story about DRF kind of reinvesting into the Missouri basketball program and in the arena like that. I think that's something that We've seen with the football program as well, and something that that re, that reflects really well on uh, what you're seeing on the field now, and what you can see on the basketball court uh, coming up for years to come too. So, I think everything's in a really good spot right now uh, for Missouri athletics. Yeah, I, I had an interview with her last week. Uh, by the time this podcast is out, I don't know when this is is going to be all done when Tucker works his magic. But Tuesday morning, I'll have the story on the site. But I mean. I basically started the interview and I said, well, this is the easiest interview you're ever going to do because it's basically just like, uh, why is every, how awesome is everything and how did yeah. you make it awesome right now? You know, I mean, it's just, there's nothing to, like, there's nothing to complain about. This right now is kind of, and really the next two weeks, and it's why I think these last two weeks were so big for Missouri. You are, I, I mean, that Saturday is basically SEC what, semifinal Saturday, right? I mean, you've got Alabama and LSU, and no disrespect to Ole Miss, but Alabama LSU could be the West kind of de facto type. The winner of that game has a great shot to win the division. Then you've got, you know, Missouri-Georgia, the winner of that game has a great shot to win the Eastern Division. Uh, And Missouri plays one of realistically three or four football games that the entire college football world is going to be talking about. And um, I think sometimes we get so caught up in looking to the future and, well, what's week 11? What's week 12? What's 2024? Are we playing these young guys enough? Like Mm. Missouri fans need to understand that don't like fast forward in this, this moment in time, because like I said on our podcast after the game, this is the game that every player comes to a place like Missouri to play. It is the game Eli Drinkwitz signed up to coach. Um, it is the game that makes all of your, you know, Maggie's nine-hour days watching Middle Tennessee and South Dakota. Like, you do it to watch this one, yeah. you know? And, and so I think, like, however it turns out, this is this is why we all do this. And I don't think that's something that Missouri fans should should gloss over. Well, it's also kind of like why we suffer through being fans as long as we suffer through being fans. And like this is no disrespect to fans of Alabama or Georgia, but like if being being a fan were easy, we would just all be fans of Alabama or Georgia. You know what I'm saying? Like it's why we suffer through the the fandoms that we do. And like my my sibling, like, well, my sibling, one of my siblings married an Alabama fan. The other one, um, well, my dad is from Columbus and they kind of stuck on the Ohio State fandom, you know, growing up. And they've had it a little bit easier than me, you know, but like, bit. I, well, I lived most of my life in Missouri and like, I knew that I wanted to, you know, kind of stick to the roots that really that I grew up in. And so it's been a lot more difficult for me but I've talked to to my brother-in-law about this a lot you know since I met him almost like 10 years ago and I was like this isn't like a knock at you but the way that you feel when you win a national championship you don't even know the way that I would feel if Mizzou won a national championship and I'm like that's no no offense but it's going to be a much greater feeling for me than it's ever going to feel for you. I can I can tell you how you will feel and I can relate it to so in 2015, after 30 years of just crap, like not even not very good, just crap, I I saw the Royals win a World Series and I tried to, 
I, I told my Cardinals fans, like I, uh, friends, it would be way better to be a fan of the Cardinals because they do this a lot more, right? And you're always there and you always have a chance. But in some way, you can never possibly have the appreciation for watching a World Series that I had for that. That's because true. you didn't go, th- you, you've never, and like, it is not, a, it's great for Cardinals fans. I wouldn't wish it on, like, it would be fun to be a fan of a team that did that on a regular basis. But when you are a fan of a team that does, like I have said forever, like I don't, if Missouri ever does win one, I, I think Missouri fans will just go, I, I don't know what to do now. Yeah. Like my whole identity, my whole life has been not winning one. What, what do I do with myself after we're, we're, we've done it? Like what did Cubs fans do after 2016? Like, like yeah. who are you after if your whole identity was not doing this and now you did it? Where do you go? The answer, unfortunately, for the Cubs and for the Royals has been back to irrelevance. But, you know. I will say I did go a long time. I my, The first Cardinals one I did see was 2006. But like you, they had their own. <laughs> they had a lot yeah, of changes. That's fair. That's fair. You I did know. get to watch them. Like they were in the playoffs. Yeah, you, I did get to watch them in the playoffs a lot. It is kind of comical that this turned into a baseball podcast now. It's kind of comical <laughs> that uh, the two years that the Royals made the playoffs, like they made it to the World Series. Like, oh, right. This is what this what you have to do. You're taking advantage. Make, make well, and it's it's kind of like what Maggie was talking about, that Big 12 title loss and the SEC title loss. Like, there are two ways to look at that, right? I mean, yeah. one is, man, those were fun years. Yep. And I, I do understand people that say that might be as close as we ever get. You know, and so that's why I'm saying this Georgia game is like, don't don't lose sight of what this is for this program. I think it's well said. I think it's a good point to end on too. Uh, but make sure you are uh, liking and subscribe to the channel. We will have that interview with uh, Coach David Nut, Dicky Nut, coming out on our audio channels as well. If, if during the bye week, if you want some basketball content, basketball's got some games coming up here at the beginning of November. They they start their non conference schedule. Got some buzz around Dennis Gates and then the fellas over there in, in Mizzou Arena. So lots of buzz around both programs uh, going into uh, the winter season here. Gabe, I'm sure that's made you quite a, uh, a busier man this time of year. Yeah, that's all right. I don't I don't mind being busy. I, I want it on the record. I will be in Athens, Georgia. There it is. The decision was made. The plans have been arranged. So you can blame me if Missouri doesn't leave. I was just about to look at flights for Athens. I was like, you know what? what? Screw it. Let's do it. Uh, I'll I'll check. I'll 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 confer with my uh, with my secretary, aka my girlfriend, um, to see if we can if we can swing it. Uh, nevertheless, we'll be back next week with another episode talking a little bit more about this matchup with Georgia. We'll have another week of college football. The landscape that kind of. Uh, clears up the picture a little bit of what this game could mean uh, for the Missouri football Tigers as well. I'm sure we'll be getting into a little bit of basketball talk as well with that coming up. Uh, but uh, any uh, any final thoughts before we depart the good people listening to the podcast? Might be talking about a recruiting class that has two five stars by the time we do another episode too. Gabe, it's that. Don't get me so excited. Don't get me so excited for that. Uh, Maggie, final when, thoughts. Wednesday at four. Wednesday at 4. Wednesday at 4. I will also be in Athens. All right. That's all. <laughs> That's going to do it for this week's edition of Mizzou The Two. That's Gabe D. Armand, and that's Maggie Johnson. I'm Tucker Franklin. We will talk to you guys next week. We'll see you soon.